All right, well, welcome to the final session of the, of the day. Thanks for hanging in there. I'm glad to see so many people here and especially so many students. I, I do think right now we have the stars of our um, fellowship program. No offense to all the professional journalists, but, but these are some of the folks who did some really tremendous work and there are students here at Marquette. Uh, I'm Greg Borowski, the Deputy Managing Editor for Projects and Investigations at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Um, I've had kind of a unique role in the fellowship. I was in on some of the discussions on how to form it and how it could work. Um, I've edited multiple parts of the different pieces, and this year I'll have the good fortune of working with Liz and Justin and Dave and, um, and Miranda. So when George Stanley before was asking how many things do you have going, I have to do this little calculation like, I wish my salary was tied to the percentage of projects I'm doing, but unfortunately it's not. Uh, anyways, what we're gonna do is, uh, you heard the previous panel was a lot of, was on Marjorie's project. This is a chance to dig in on what the students did on the other two from last year. So we're gonna introduce some kind of student by student and project by project, and we're gonna see some of the videos and work they did, and then get some you know, feedback and thoughts from them on what they learned and, and how it all worked. So uh, Patrick has the good fortune of sitting next to me, so he's gonna go, he's our first person. Um, Patrick is a graduate uh, from this past May, correct? Of, the, the journalism program. He interned while he was a student at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel and worked for Neighborhood News Service. And over the summer, he was the O'Brien Fellow at the Arizona Republic. And that, to me, is one of the really cool parts about the program is you, as a student, you don't just get to participate during the academic year. Some get to go be an intern back in the professional world. So we're going to show, if we could, uh, first a video that uh, Patrick did with the project. He was working with Brandon Loomis. Well, while we're working on that, we're going to talk a little bit, Patrick, about what your role was with Brandon on the project, sure. and then we'll talk about the, what you did over the summer. Um, yeah, so when I was here at Marquette my senior year, um, Brandon, um, I was assigned to work with Brandon, and um, Brandon's project, obviously, you talked about it this morning. Oh, thanks. Um, but um, we... I think the most significant thing, at least the first semester I was working with Brandon, was I got to travel to Las Vegas um, to um, help Brandon um, with interviewing, and this video, if it ever plays, um, comes from that trip um, where we did things like visit Hoover Dam, we had an all-access tour to Hoover Dam, and um, interviewed uh, numerous sources um, for Brandon's uh, project uh, and got to talk to him. Okay, yeah. we're good. Okay, go ahead. Cool. In um, October, basically from 11 p.m. to 7 p.m. So we don't want you to water during the hottest part, hottest uh, portion of the day. And a lot of water uh, is lost to evaporation and misting. And it's usually a little breezy here all the time. So the best time to water is really very early morning and that's what we recommend. Or, or day of the week, I have to see it. Now there could, um, if they're allowed to water this day, there can be a guy out there in the middle of summer with a hose watering his lawn if he wants to. So here we go. This is a day of the week violation. Today's Thursday, their assigned watering days are for fall, the water restrictions are Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So they're watering on the wrong day of the week. So what we're going to do, we took a film of it, we're going to send them a letter letting them know that they're watering on the wrong day of the week. I'm going to leave them the door hanging with the watering restriction guidelines. Where everyone had the green lush lawns and everyone moved here from the Midwest or back east and they wanted to replicate what was there. In today's world, we can't. So yeah, with that, um that uh, morning we went on a ride along with sort of a concept that's not really um, familiar to people that aren't in water scarce areas. Was, that was basically a water cop essentially. Um, and when we went to Las Vegas we got to see, you know. We both know why I'm here. Isn't yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we got to experience sort of what um, these sort of drought conditions look like. Um, and I think that was um, really valuable. And I sort of served as the videographer on that trip. And then in the spring, I worked on a story about um, Waukesha um, trying to uh, divert water from the Great Lakes um, 
to solve their um, uh, water issues that they've been experiencing, and that um, was just published earlier this week. All right, well, let me ask you this question, and you guys will probably see the same question. Um, what did you learn the most, I think, in terms of your growth as a journalist on this project? And, and then what did, how did it change you on a more personal level? Sure. Um, well, I'd never done any sort of environmental, environmental reporting before. That was completely um, foreign to me. So it was a huge um, transition in that regard. And I was just able to you know, add to my um, depth of things I've reported on, which was awesome. And completely had, was sort of unaware, having never lived in the Southwest, of the um, massive issues facing that part of the country. Um, and that was huge. And then, obviously, being able to go to Arizona this summer, um, experience that I wouldn't have gotten um, any other way. Um, the the O'Brien Fellowship gave me that opportunity to be a part of this national internship program um, that um, the uh, Republic, Arizona Republic has. Um, so just that experience um, was massive. And then just me personally, um, Definitely uh, going down there and living in the you know drought conditions um, um, was eye-opening to see um, the kind of and Phoenix I don't know if Phoenix is would be classified as the worst of the major cities that have to deal with this but um, just seeing um, the the kind of um, I guess precautions that people have to take um, and um, experiencing sort of like that they devote like a you know, public police force to enforcing that water because the issue is so severe. Um, sort of just an eye-opening um, experience that part of our country has to you know deal with that on a regular basis. I have a basis. question for you. Yeah. Is, is it, can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, did you notice that going there and working on the reporting projects in the Southwest, did you suddenly have different behaviors with your water consumption, like living here and then suddenly going there and working on this project where you suddenly like, oh, I'm taking very long showers or, whoa, I'm wasting water while I brush my teeth. I don't know. I think the biggest transition um, down there is I am originally from Seattle and so um, recycling is a huge deal in Seattle. Um, that's a huge deal. So bottled water um, as a result is naturally like really frowned upon in Seattle and you know everyone's all about you know water bottles and all that kind of stuff so but in Phoenix the quality of the tap water is so terrible um, that unless you're buying bottled water like from the that's basically your only options to go to the store and buy bottled water if you want um, cold um, drinking water on a regular basis. So that's such a it was such a different transition that normally I would never like rely on bottled water, but that was the only way to get besides um, like getting a filter and you know putting it in your fridge. The only way to get bottled water right away was, or um, cold uh, good drinking water right away was to buy bottled water. So that was definitely an interesting transition, and they really don't. Um, you know, recycle as much because they have to focus on, you know, that um, as an important part of their consumption down there. That was a big transition, I noticed. Yeah. Let me introduce Teresa Soli next. And I had everyone just send me their own little bio, and usually I just play with them to make them consistent, but hers I just have to read as she wrote it because uh -oh. she says, Teresa came to Marquette to dry out after a fisheries biology stint in the Bering Sea. So she's probably the only person in this room who can say that. Uh, she's grateful so. to have been part of such a talented journalism team, an interesting reporting project. She began, will begin a news reporting internship on Monday. On Monday, so it's a good job already for a new internship, <laughs> and plans to complete her master's degree at Marquette over the next year. So I can imagine what other project you would have wound up working on than the Brandon's with your background. But tell everybody a little bit about what your piece was, and then we're going to show a video from you as well. Yeah. Um, so I was really lucky when I started talking with Brandon. Um, I think I probably told him that I was taking a fish biology class at UWM, um, which was really cool that I've gotten to take some classes here and some science classes at the fisheries uh, school at UWM as well. Um, and so he matched me with this project and it turned out to be a really good match. Um, and so I went down to South America with Brandon 
um, my project was focused um, on Lake Titicaca in Peru, um, but we also went to Bolivia as well, and the lake is on the border of the two. Um, and it was a really special experience because I got to observe Brandon as an, as an experienced reporter um, in all of his work and um, his interviews and how he puts everything together. Um, but I also got to work on my own project as well. Um, and it was a really incredible opportunity. I think I was very lucky to have been kind of handed that. And Brandon found a perfect match for me as well. So. All right, to tell everybody what your own project was. Oh, the, oh, the reporting project, yes. yeah. Um, so the project that I was working on was uh, trying to create a connection with uh, Great Lakes invasions of fish um, in Lake Michigan and connecting them with uh, the same sorts of problems in other Great Lakes of the world. And Lake Titicaca is one of those lakes. Um, and so there are a few different species of fish that were brought uh, to Lake Titicaca from the Great Lakes region that caused uh, havoc in the lake there. Um, and it was probably 80 years ago that uh, trout were originally brought from North America to South America. Um, so it's probably a story that could have been worked on a long time ago, and it doesn't seem like it had really happened. Um, but there have been um, some possible local extinctions of the native fish there, which we've also noticed in Lake Michigan. Um, but the, the local population there also really um, depends upon the lake and its fish and is very intertwined with the fish, fishing culture there. So it's really cool to connect some of the personal stories and everyone's heard of you know, the Incas and whatnot and, and put it all together. So. All right, so we'll show that video in a second. I just wanted to mention Brandon had told me about Teresa. They had gone out and there's this other story that didn't quite fit his project as much about the invasives, but we've written a lot at the Journal Sentinel. And he, so he sends the story and says, look at it, see what you're thinking. I'm like, this is a heck of a story. And we worked on it over the summer. We made the front page of the Journal Sentinel just about a month ago. So let's see the, uh, Teresa's video. She one-ups Patrick because she's, we're going to work on it. They're working on the video. Oh. Okay, but she one-ups one Patrick because she's the videographer and the star of the video. Right? <laughs> so, uh, but tell, what, how did you sort of grow as a journalist and grow personally from the, you know, the, this pro process and the project? Yeah, well, so my background originally was in biology, so I had no idea what, um, what I was doing at all starting this project. Um, and I guess for me, I think there are four different segments of work and how I could split things up. And maybe for an experienced journalist, that's normal. I'm not really sure. Um, but of course, I had to do some research um, beforehand a lot of research and trying to figure out what I was reporting on because I didn't really know at first. I had to kind of figure out what the story was. Um, and then, of course, there's being on the ground in the field um, in South America as well. Um, and then afterward, there's coming back and there's writing and putting the whole story together and making it. And then there were revisions, of course. Um, I was lucky Brandon and Greg as well both uh, worked on that with me. So I mean, there are a lot of people that took part in it as well. But for me, everything was a learning experience because I was brand new, and I still am. But. All right, how, did you, how do you think you grew kind of personally on the project? Did you learn anything about yourself in terms of you know, your, your abilities or, what, yeah. or how to tackle difficult things? Maybe it gave me a sense of confidence in my writing or something, that or maybe something. I can pursue that sort of job. It, it should have because we had it. It's, it's a great story. So people should go Thanks. read it. You can read the first like five paragraphs on the board over there, but then you'll have to <laughs> go online to read the rest. Do we have the video? Okay, we'll come back to her video. Let's talk about. Uh, let me choose the next three here who are all part of Raquel's project. Um, if, for those who weren't here th this morning, uh, Raquel's project dealt with the chemical diacetyl. I think you guys get all honorary chemistry degrees when you <laughs> do graduate after that work, um, and. And they spent a ton of time digging in because you heard Raquel this morning talk about how the project they had envisioned changed on the day they arrived to start the, their work. But let me introduce them and then we'll hear from them. So Sarah Hauer is the closest to me right in the middle. She's a second year graduate school in the college and she's the first, she's a three-time O'Brien Fellowship student assistant. So her next step is to come back and be an O'Brien Fellow. <laughs> Uh, and she worked on with Raquel on her project, and she was our intern at the Journal Sentinel 
through the O'Brien Fellowship for the summer. She did a great work on PolitiFact and um, our Precious Lives series about gun violence on youth and, and a lot of great work. And then next is Alyssa Vobro. This is her last semester as a graduate student studying health and science communication. She says she's working on her professional project preparing to apply for jobs in the healthcare or higher education sector. And then Robin St. John, who snuck in, uh, <laughs> is a graduate from this past May. And she, you know, she went to Texas with Raquel on the, to find, talk to the coffee workers. And you just started a job at Manpower? Monday. Monday. So they're getting employed, which is good. Uh, why don't you guys, and I'll start with Sarah, talk about you know, what did you guys do on the project, and then we'll talk about what you kind of learned as you did it. But describe your role, Sarah, and what you, yeah. you dug in on. So I wasn't sure that I was coming back to Marquette for graduate school when Raquel was named a fellow, and I was kind of sad that I wasn't going to get to work with her. So I actually started with her during the second semester. So I missed all of the drama of we no longer have a project. <laughs> so when I signed on, we knew that we were going to be focusing on diacetyl, and there was also this idea that Alyssa had had with Raquel and that was bubbling up to do a survey of e-cig use on campus because they had also found uh, diacetyl had been in these e-cig juices. So Raquel sent us out into the vape shops. We made a lot of friends. We hung out. Um, we did. <laughs> I never would have thought that I would know so much about electronic cigarettes as I do now. Uh, <laughs> And then it was also great, Alyssa and I got to use what we had been learning in our master's classes to design a survey, administer it, analyze data, uh, and that'll be coming out soon. And then this summer I was so, so lucky to be with Greg at the Journal Sentinel and, like he said, working on PolitiFact, getting to sit kitty corner from Dave Umhaver, uh, writing just really important stories and it was really fun. All right, and Alyssa, do you want to talk about your, your role? Yeah, um, so I started this as kind of an outsider. I had no journal, previous journalism experience. I was actually interested in the original topic, which was natural flavorings and food. And when that was no longer the topic, I was kind of like, oh, do I still really want to do this? And I am so glad that I did. Um, on top of being able to do the survey with Sarah, um, we were able to design the timeline together that is a part of the story um, following diaspora. Over the years, uh, Raquel and I were actually able to talk, uh, speak to a class um, in Syria, a class of investigative journalists, and talk about um, kind of the differences between um, that. Um, and then uh, doing the, the, just interviewing the uh, vapors, yeah, the vapors <laughs> and um, just so many things that I would have never had the opportunity to do otherwise. So. And Robin, do you want to talk maybe a little bit about the Texas yeah, trip and how that went? So we talked a lot about this chemical diacetyl, and it was one of those things we didn't know so much about it, but to make it more interesting, we always have to have a person. So Raquel was like, we've got to find a person, we've got to find a person, we've got to find a person. So finally we did. Uh, after a while then, I got to fly out to Texas with Raquel, which was an amazing experience, and it kind of took the chemical and made it more of like a humanized story to actually see the people who were affected by it. Whereas, because you can talk about something all day and all night, but until you see someone that it's actually affected, it, it's not the same to the readers and to the viewers of the story. So that was such an amazing experience, and it was awesome to be able to kind of see how this plays in their everyday life and how much these people are affected on an everyday basis just because of this one chemical. All right, I should mention uh, Kelly Meyer author is here. She introduced George earlier. She was part of the project with Raquel, too, and also did great work. She talked before about being intimidated in our newsroom, and I told her afterwards she has no reason to be intimidated in our newsroom. Now, or do any of these folks, you, and you could tell when you land in a professional world and you're able to do that work, I mean, that's, your stories are, have been great. And I was, I was just thinking, we were sitting here about all the process we went through on Raquel's story, because we had a lot of meetings in her little office going through, you know, what do we do now? This one fell through. Let's just look at these chemicals, and we're going through, we're studying them and building spreadsheets and things. And these guys, on Eddie, every turn, you know, they did what they were asked to do. They came through. They, they got rock-solid research, and they got it in there. 
could have been a reality show, though. It would have been kind of fun <laughs> to, to have been filming it and seeing, you know, because Robin was working for what Starbucks, right? She's like, well, I can look on the labels of the of the of the flavorings we get in for Starbucks, and we're worried about her and the pumpkin spice flavor. And is, is, is Robin going to die before the project's over? And, you know, all kinds of stuff, you know. It, it was great. But um, let me ask you guys the same question: How did you grow most as a as a journalist and as a person through the through the tasks? And we're going to hit Sarah first. Me first. Yeah. Shoot. Uh, it was outstanding. Uh, being able to watch someone like Raquel work and how she thinks and reporting back to her what you had researched and then hearing her thoughts on what next steps would be, especially when we were looking at scientific studies and she was always, always challenging us with, well, who paid for that study? And that was one of the really great lessons from working with her was always thinking about where's, where's the money. Uh, and then being able to be at the Journal Sentinel this summer really, I'm trying to think of what word is going to be most accurate, but it kind of reaffirmed that that's really where I'd want to be. I had a fantastic summer and I, I loved what I did and it made me know that I'd like to keep doing it. So. I want to just interject one thing because I know Sarah from her time at the Market Tribune, and I remember at the end of her senior year, she and Tessa Fox were saying, well, "What are you going to do for your careers?" And I, I, I was disheartened because she's like, "Well, I'm going to apply for this job at was it NML or someplace or some corporate thing." And I was some like, corporate thing. I was like, "Well, okay, I do know people at NML. I could probably help you at NML. I'm happy to help you." But then later, when I saw her that fall, and she's walking down the street at the journal, front of the Journal Sentinel, and she's like. I'm back in grad school, this, uh -huh. and then I said, well, we got her on the right path again. So that's, I, I, I think so. <laughs> um, I think just being a team member, I guess before this, I thought investigative journalism was like the reporter and the story, and that was it, and that's just totally not the case. There are so many people that go into producing um, these pieces, the, the videographers, the photographers, the research assistants, um, the editors, everybody. Um, so I just, I think being a part of that dynamic is was wonderful for me. And to see how, when you're looking at data and thinking about it, how can it be presented in a video? How can it be presented? And how can we tell the story in so many different ways? And how can we all work together to do that? Um, that was really cool. And then the confidentiality piece, like you can't trust anyone. You can only talk to your team. And yeah, we don't, we don't talk about it. So um, <laughs> that was new to me. It's just the, the sensitive, sensitivity behind it. Um, and then being flexible, I mean, like I said, when I came into this, I thought we were doing one thing, and then we're doing another thing, and then we're mm -hmm. trying to find a chemical that we can talk about, and uh, just the- Publication the, day got moved up like a month. Yeah, and it was just like, oh my gosh. Um, but that's in any career, you have to be ready to, ready to be flexible, ready to kind of roll with the punches, and um, so I learned that. I think just kind of as a person, um, just following your passion, I know that sounds so cliche, but Raquel is such a good example of the passion behind investigative reporting, which is the truth and the justice, and how can we tie this back to the consumers? How can we tie this back to um, the, the, the victims, the patients? How can we tie this back to the public? And how can we make this just relevant? And so for me, that in any career, I don't know where I'm gonna end up, but just that passion that fuels like the end goal. So. All right, Robin? They spoke so well on so many different things. So I'll go on the chemical side where I was like, I have no idea what diacetyl is. And so, you have to have that confidence to kind of jump in, research it, and pretend like you kind of know what you're talking about sometimes until you eventually do. And then if you don't know something, research, research, research until you can't research anymore. And then after that, you'll probably have to research something else that's similar to that or kind of another chemical because if there's one chemical, usually there's two similar to that. Like diastole has two, three, pentadine. Mm -hmm. yep. And so now I know that. Um, and <laughs> just keep going and keep going and going. So, it's something I never thought I'd know so much about chemicals, and I'm so happy that I do now. <laughs> and Raquel, like, she also gave us examples of other stories to read and look mm -hmm. at during our time. That was really helpful for me, not only because I learned by doing, but she challenged us to say, well, where did they get this information, and how could they have presented this information better, and just constantly pushing us to you know, think about other um, reports, too. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, this is why I think it should have been a reality show because we'd have these meetings we'd go through, they'd be, the assignment would be like, learn all you can about these chemicals, and then you come back and learn, we'd go, go through, well, there's no studies showing that's harmful, there's, this one's fine, there's nothing, we're like, oh, darn it, you know, and then we finally get diacetyl, it's killing people, it's killing copper workers, 
yes, we've got our story. You know, that's sort of the twisted world you live in as the journalist as you're pursuing, because we knew there were problems with some of these chemicals, and we just had to identify how do we tell that story. So I don't, do we have the video, or I, the, we don't, okay. Well, you'll have to try, you'll see Sarah's video on Wednesday, I think, when, uh -huh. when our eSig stuff publishes. But let me ask each of you guys, um, because you've got a lot of students here from who are hopefully potential future interns in this program. What's your best piece of advice for those students in terms of how to how to prepare for this opportunity? I want to go down the line. But I may have Patrick. What do you think? Sure. Um, I would say just keep an open mind and be prepared to do something you've never done before. Um, and I don't know if there's you know you mentioned like ways they can prepare themselves. Like I don't know if you can really prepare for something like that. Um, but just be open to doing completely new things. Because I remember, um, you know, they're talking about learning all the stuff about chemistry. Um, I remember the first month that Brandon was trying to teach uh, me about like stuff with like water regulation and like how it was supposed to work. I, it just made my head hurt and I like couldn't uh, really wrap my brain around it until we went to Las Vegas and I actually like saw what it looked like and that sort of opened it, opened my mind up to it and you know I was able to sort of grasp, all right, this is kind of the general problem that we're dealing with. So I guess for an opportunity like this, you know, don't feel like you have to know like everything about the subject that you're going into, keep, keep an open mind and be willing to learn stuff because the opportunity, like me being able to go to Arizona um, this summer is so great at the end of it that it's, you know, um, and you get so much experience throughout um, the time, so be open to uh, working on something that you may not know much about going in. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, um, I would say maybe be a go-getter. Um, because both Sarah and I came into the program and we hadn't been here the semester before so we didn't properly like apply for it and so we just you know approached Herb and talked to him about it and I ended up in South America um, and so you know having the, the energy and the excitement to, to pursue it and go up to someone and say hey I want to do this and have the, the push all the way through and the excitement I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, hmm. This is my third time, or er, Raquel is my second. I'm now working with Dave on his project. And I think mostly just knowing that there's going to be a ton of learning that you're going to need to do. Uh, like with Raquel, when I came in at semester, trying to catch up on all of these scientific studies everyone's been reading, everyone else had kind of, you know, jumped onto the learning curve and I was starting at square one. And now with Dave, we're looking into teaching contracts and it all explodes in my head. Uh, but so not getting frustrated, I would say, is the biggest thing because you're going to have to learn a lot of new stuff and become a pseudo expert on topics you never probably thought about before. <laughs> um, just be confident in your own abilities and take advantage of any opportunity that's put in front of you. I think so many of us kind of, I mean, even myself, I'm guilty of it, not taking advantage of something because I, all the, I, maybe I can't or I haven't done that before, and that's just not the case. Um, there have been so many positive outcomes of this, this opportunity for me. I actually was the recipient of a National Hellenic Scholar, Journalist Scholarship um, last year based on my work with the project, and I had, had no previous journalism experience. So there are so many um, different facets that you can't see. Just be confident in your ability, seize the moment, seize opportunity. Okay, that's good, Rob, and then we get to, we'll show the video then. Um, I think one other thing is have fun with it. Mm -hmm. And looking back, it's one of the best experiences I've had at Marquette. So it, it's such an awesome opportunity. There's not many times in your life you get to work with the best of the best and then get to learn from them. And that's sometimes you're placed below the class. So mm -hmm. it's such a great opportunity. It was such a fun experience looking back to you. Yeah. I mean, the frustrations, <laughs> in the moment it seems more frustrating, but long term, it was such a fun time, too. Okay, so I think we're able to show <laughs> a video. Not sure which one we're getting, but we're going to see one of them here. Okay, this is uh, Teresa's from, from Peru. Bolivia. Where? Bolivia, same thing. Oh, Bolivia, okay. 
So uh, behind me, you'll notice a boat. It's pretty simple. It has no motor. There are actually two of them right here. And these are the boats that the local fishermen go out and continue to do all their fishing on. Um, so there are two of them sitting on the shore right There's here. There's a burned log. Um, there's also some netting, and it looks like a homemade buoy uh, of some sort made out of plastic bottles. Um, so let's take a look at that. This is the net right here. This is a bunch of plastic bottles that are connected with some sort of netting, and they're empty, so it looks like it floats. So some sort of fishing buoy or something. So, the fishermen still do things pretty simple around here. Um, the people are still definitely living off the land. They're relying on the lake to catch their fish. They're relying on the water to uh, provide water for the quinoa that they grow, and the corn and the potatoes and whatnot. It's definitely still a simple life here. And um, in the United States, we would probably call it, call it poverty, but uh, I think there are some really nice things about the simplicity and the way that people here still live off the land. So I've appreciated working on the stories here. Okay. This is the one that Sarah put together on the, what people know about vaping. After. These are Marquette students. Right? I would guess true. False. So true or false, electronic cigarettes are regulated. False. True. Uh, false. Uh, true. Um, true? I think. <laughs> I would say false. Just because they're so new and the government moves so slow, but I don't know for sure. Why do you say true? Um, I just feel like they would be. Okay, why do you think that? I just hear on um, advertisements or read in print advertisements that it's a lot healthier. So, I mean, I haven't done my research or anything, but just reading that over and over that it's healthier, mm -hmm. I would assume there would have to be something to back that up, some kind of approval or mm -hmm. research behind it. I assume uh, all tobacco products are regulated on some level. I don't know if e-cigarettes are more regulated or less regulated than regular cigarettes. I think that um, e-cigarettes are close enough to cigarettes that they would be grouped under the, the cigarette category or the tobacco product category, and I know that those are fairly heavily watched over. I don't know. I feel like, I don't know. I, feel, I just feel like they would be. Okay. Well, that gives you a good taste of it. The way, and for, you know, for our version, we've got the titles and things. This is an earlier yeah. version we happened to grab today. But let me ask one last question before we open it to the audience, and that is, and one of the virtues of the fellowship when we were creating it was we thought it would give students the opportunity to work alongside this world-class journalist. So I want to ask, starting on the other end this time, what is one trait from your journalists that you've picked up that you want to sort of emulate in your own career? Um, don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask anything. Like, even if you don't know something, just be like, can you explain this to me? And if they're an expert, which is usually the person you're trying to talk to, then they'll explain to you everything you need to know. And then from that, you can go do more research and learn more about that. And I would love that's my everyday life. Now when I don't know something, I'll look it up and then not be afraid to ask somebody else if they know the answer to that. Yeah, critical thinking and curiosity. Just there's all there are always more questions to be asked. It's not good enough to just know something on the surface level. You should know five to ten layers of that. Um, so just always asking questions, always being curious. Mm -hmm. uh, to say something a little bit different. One thing that Raquel struggled with for a while was getting the coffee roasters to buy into letting her into the facilities to do her testing for diacetyl and 2,3-pentadione. And I remember sitting in her office with her brainstorming, how do we pitch this to the coffee roasters? How do we get them to let us into their facility? So really being a salesman for your stories is something that I definitely learned. Um, I guess I have two different things that kind of go together. Um, Brandon is pretty laid back. 
And I think that he kind of approached most of his interview interviewees um, in that way. And I think it's, you, you know, making someone that you're interviewing feel comfortable and at ease and not like you're quizzing them or accusing them of anything at all. Just having that demeanor, I think, is really important. Um, and I think also, I guess it's both about interviewing. Um, he has an ability to be pretty stoic and calm all the time. And even in a couple, you know, somewhat stressful um, situations, he kept his stern, grim face in a good grim. way. Because no, no, he I doesn't mean, look that grim. In a bad way. But in, in stressful situations where he just kept stoic. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just remember when we were in Las Vegas, watching Brandon interview was just kind of eye-opening. I was sitting there filming it and just kind of just be like, wow, like, he, like, was really prepared for his interview. That was something that I was like, I need to work on watching him do that. Um, but also, um, just if you have someone willing to sit down with you for a period of time, don't be afraid to push them on things that you didn't expect them to say and ask them to dig deeper with that um, as far as interviewing goes. Um, watching him do that was sort of, you know, it's very instructive to, you know, as much as you can be told how to interview someone, like when you watch someone that's been doing it for decades do it, then it's just so, it's so eye-opening and um, makes you a better interviewer by watching it. I just want to note before we take questions, that one of the early discussions we had when we were building these things and doing individual projects was what, what do we think the students can reasonably do given their time as a student and their experience level. And I think every year we've been in this and having met and worked with the students already for this next batch, it's like we ratchet it up a little bit each time and that more and more of their stuff is fully integrated with the project. It's not a case where, oh, the students have the kitty table over here for their stuff, and the, here's the adult table. It's all put together, and I'm sure the fellows would agree with the, the, sort of what they bring to the table. So we have a few minutes left. I'm interested if there are any questions. We're happy to take them. If not, we'll, we'll find some more videos to watch. <laughs> Wyatt, who's back there, who I uh, very much, uh, very much am proud of, and also Hannah Kirby, who was here. But what did you think that uh, was the most rewarding things that you guys, uh, I know what you got out of it, but what was rewarding to you as a college student to experience? And what were maybe some things during this experience that didn't work, you know, as far as the assignments you were given and things that you were doing? Um. Right, jump right okay. in. Um, so I enjoyed um, getting a lot of independence on the project, and I know it might be different for different students, um, but you know, giving me the independence to kind of work on it on my own, it was a great learning experience because I had to do it all myself, um, and it forced me to learn, but also being able to pursue <coughs> our own interests within your story, I think, is really incredible because it's one thing working on your story and your interests, but it's another to say, these are your interests and up, can I take it in my own way? So, yeah. Anybody else want to jump in? Just building and teachable, everything's a teachable moment. Like Raquel taught us so much just in the process, every, every time something happened, well, this is why we do this, and this is why mm -hmm. this happens, and that's very helpful for learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talked a lot just about journalistic process, mm -hmm. and that was always really, really helpful, and insightful. Uh, I can't think of an example of something that didn't work. We critiqued a lot of work. stories. We'd like read yeah. other people's stories that were great journalism and they were said to be great journalism and then we're like, how can we make this better? Mm -hmm. Like even though it's great, it could be better. Yeah, yeah I couldn't think of anything to improve Yeah. That. Um, I mean, just sort of big picture, I thought it was kind of cool to see sort of like a direct link as to how Marquette was you know, giving me an opportunity to um, further my future pursuits, I guess, with journalism. I think it was cool just directly like pairing me up with a professional journalist and in the end giving me a 10-week internship at a really reputable newspaper that was sort of the direct link was really cool to see, um, you know, just beyond like the whole, you know, body of the education. It was just a really good um, opportunity. 
And then to sort of speak to what didn't work, um, I mean, I don't know if I can think of anything specific, but there are definitely like growing pains, like especially when you first get started, um, of sort of what you're expected to do on a regular basis. Um, but it's all about you know developing a rapport um, with the, from my perspective, with the fellow, but from yours with the students, and um, you know, outlining expectations, and you know, um, it after you know a few weeks, it sort of begins to take care of itself. I have something that can be improved. It took a really long time for me to find out if my funding was going to be there or not. So <laughs> not that that was your fault. Right. Right. But take a All right. You have a question? Yeah, my, I think actually the answer to both of yeah. because my, my question was really if you were in charge of the program next semester, next year, how would, what would you change to make it better? Wow. They're all thinking if they should say give Herb a raise or not. <laughs> yeah. They're thinking they don't look bad, like we're kissing up or this, whatever. Okay, come on, give us a good answer. Hmm. I'm just going to randomly pick on people. Sarah, you're in the middle. I know, I am. You're in it, you're in it this year, so what are we? I you am. Right now, time? I'm having a very good time with Dave. No complaints. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm working for Sarah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but I think as much as it can be tailored to different students for the different teams that are going on, um, the more that each person can really pursue what their strengths are, I think it really helps out the team a lot. So just focusing, focusing everyone's attentions on where they'll be most useful to the group. Other ideas? I would say getting as many students involved as possible um, because um, even if you're not you know, the student that's selected to go over the summer to do the internship, um, it's a unique experience that working with a professional journalist that you're not going to be able to get um, on a regular basis. And even if you can't you know, commit a ton of time to it, if you have other things going on, having um, and, and obviously, as long as the journalist has work for people to be able to do, but if you can even contribute to a, like an impressive professional um, long-term project like the ones that the O'Brien Fellowship has been doing, um, I think that's a valuable experience for anyone. Okay, with the guys on the end. I, you can mention more gummy worms or regular, oh, that was a problem. Oh, we occasionally oh, ran out of gummy worms, right? <laughs> no, I think something, we talk a lot about like what they could do better, but I think reviews of us as students would be good to have, just like kind of mm -hmm. beginning, middle, and end, kind of how we improved as journalists too, like what they saw improve in us. Mm -hmm. One thing that I did think of is it would be nice to have more discussion with the other student assistants on the different projects, because our team was really close and we talked and had fun at our meetings, but it'd be really nice to be able to talk to all the other student assistants about what they're doing and how their projects are going, because they kind of go, go along in their own. Yeah. I think that's a good Fine. suggestion, especially this year, because all the teams are at the same stage of gathering a lot of data, and it's a, a long, slow, tough slog, and maybe they provide find some support and encouragement from the others who are working on it. Are there any other questions, or are we out of time? Are there any other questions? Okay. To your project. What foreign fish? What the lake went to Lake Titicaca? I'm which, dying of curiosity. Which were the invasive fish from yes. North America? Um, I think it was five different species of trout. Trout. So lake trout and rainbow trout, and the reason for that is they're so good to eat. And so, I mean, you can read the story. You can read yeah, the story. Right. <laughs> um, but but the reason they're brought there is because all the native fish are really small. They're a few inches long, so they're not really considered a sufficient food source. I mean, the people there have been eating them for thousands of years, but a trout is this big, and a killifish that's native is that big. And they ate those? They've been eating them for a long time, but now they eat trout, too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just curious. <laughs> um, let's uh, stay there. Let's give them applause, please. So just uh, as I close, um, I really uh, 
hate to say good things. I love bragging about the O'Brien fellows, and I love bragging about the O'Brien students, just not in front of them. So <laughs> what I'm going to say is hurt, what might hurt. Um, last night, we were having dinner with the O'Brien fellows and Greg and a couple others. We were trying to do a toast, and my main message was just get here for Brandon's session this morning. But when I got home last night and thought about it, I thought these are some of the, we talk and look at their great journalism, but these are some of the finest people I've ever met, and um, that's what makes it so wonderful. Um, I, you know, I had Patrick and Sarah in particular as sophomores, and what I enjoy about the program as it relates to our O'Brien fellow uh, students is seeing them grow, um, and and you know, from where they first come into journalism 1100 to where they are now ready for this kind of project is really wonderful. So you met Kelly the other day, just one of my favorite stories. You met her today, actually. I'm sorry. She was one to introduce Greg. Raise your hand, Kelly. So each of our O'Brien fellows, and um, Justin has been asking some questions, and Dave and um, Liz, um, and then there's Miranda. So each time we get a cohort, you've heard about the application process. And so they want to know what students they're going to work in. So I'd send out what the projects are going to be. And all the students say, OK, I want some of this. I want to be with this one, or maybe this one. Or please just pick me for anything. Mm -hmm. So they get all these applications. And then comes Kelly's um, from overseas. She was studying abroad in Rome. So they were like, oh, we all want Kelly. We all want Kelly. And they're listening. They're talking, please, can I have Kelly? Can I have Kelly? So I just say, OK, no. Here's what, how it's going to happen. Each of you are going to get on Skype with Kelly from Rome, she's going to interview you, and then she's going to come to me and tell me which one of them she wants to work for. And what I love about that is that is the quality of our students, that each of them are vying for this student, and she was interested in all four of the projects, and we talked about it and figured out which one she wanted to work with that would be there. So there's all, you met Aaron Corey, you heard about Aaron Corey, there's always one student where I need to get that one done so the rest of the dominoes can fall. So um, I just want to say thanks to my friends over there from OMC. Um, the university uh, really provides a lot of support for this program from advancement. Um, Jay in the back, my baller, my co-baller, and uh, Paul um, here who's so helpful here. To our special guests, thank you for coming. This is really um, exciting and to have you here. Um, particularly to my best friends, the Prechettes. You've changed my life, or at least kept me in Milwaukee a lot longer than I thought it was going to be. Um, and to Dr. Pauli and to Dr. Garner for uh, staying out of my way and being there when I need you. So thank you. Um, mostly when I need you, because you know, I need a lot. So other than that, um, thank you to all of the presenters here. Um, this has been a great program. And as I like to say, this program is over. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.